All right, thank you so much. More family singers. And did you notice the three-part harmony that's now coming out of those girls? Uh, I'm a big believer in phonics in the school system, and I'm a big believer in harmony. So I'm glad they're learning that as well. Men, as we take our copy of God's Word, ladies and men, Matthew chapter 21, 18, I want to give a special word to the men today. Um, the Lord, you know, Brother Jerry mentioned earlier how iron sharpens iron. I saw some statistics online. I just want to read these to you. Uh, it's not original to me. It just simply says, where men fulfill their callings, things flourish. Where they refuse, things burn. Some people will call that misogyny, but the truth is, that's reality. And yet, despite mountains of evidence that our culture insists that men are unnecessary, masculinity is toxic, recognizing the above reality is patriarchy, and that men are interchangeable with women. The facts is, here are the stats on fatherlessness. 63% of youth suicides, 90% of youth homeless runaways, 85% of youth behavior disorders, 80% of rapist anger issues, 71% of all high school dropouts, 75% of youth patients in chemical abuse centers, 85% of all youth in prison. President Obama, of all people, once noted that children without fathers are 500% more likely to live in poverty and commit crime, not 900% more likely to drop out of schools and 2,000% more likely to end up in prison. In fact, fatherlessness is a better predictor of incarceration than race or poverty. The famous atheists of modernity, of modernity, whether Sigmund Freud or Friedrich Nietzsche or John Paul Sartre or David Hume, Bertrand Russell, Madeleine Murray O'Hare, all different in every way except one. They all had an absentee or traumatic relationship with their father. Conversely, if a family member comes to Christ, the likelihood of the rest of the family coming to Christ with a wife, it's 18%. With children, it's 22%. But if the father comes to faith in Christ, 94% of the rest of the family are likely to do the same. So listen, I'm not going to get political with us, but you want to solve the poverty gap Good men and fathers. You want to solve the education, education crisis? Good men and fathers. You want to solve the drug and opioid epidemic? Good men and fathers. You want to eradicate youth suicide spike? Good men and fathers. Attempts at societal reforms are pointless if they do not include fostering stable families with present men as fathers. This is why the Scripture says that when a move of the Spirit happens, the Scripture says one of the first things He does is turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to to their fathers. Bad men can become good men when they're filled with the spirit of the perfect man, Jesus Christ, who was as tough as a lion, as tender as a lamb, and who laid down his life in love to protect, provide, and care for those he loved. 1 Corinthians 16, 13 says this, be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong, let all that you do be done in love. I want to encourage all of the men, get in a group. We need you right now, you're not meant to do it by yourself, and if we will band together and be men of God, I believe God will do great things. That's sermon number one. Let's go to sermon number two, Matthew chapter 21 and verse 18. We'll remember what Jesus has been doing. This is the last earthly week of his life. As he goes to the temple, he has drawn out the money changers. Every time that Jesus goes down to Jerusalem, a riot breaks out. And now, as he goes there for the final time, he's driven out the people who were standing on the court of the Gentiles in the place where it was supposed to be designated as a house of prayer. He says, have you not heard that my house shall be called a house of prayer? Now, as he's passing back along the way, something seemingly bizarre happens. I want you to look with me in verse 18. It says, in the morning, as he was returning to the city, he had gone back to Bethany, lodged there with his friends, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, who you'll remember. In the morning, as he was returning to the city, he became hungry and seeing a fig tree by the wayside, he went to it and found nothing on it but only leaves. And he said to it, May no fruit ever come from you again. And the tree withered at once. When the disciples saw it, they marveled, How did the fig tree wither at once? And Jesus answered them, Truly I say to you, If you have faith and do not doubt, 
You will not only do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, it will happen. And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. If you saw the Super Bowl last Sunday, you saw a commercial that showed Jesus washing the feet of people with seemingly judgmental Christians in the background of all kinds of controversial issues. And at the end of the commercial, it says, he gets us, and he gets you, and he does get us. But he also saves us, and he sanctifies us, and he frees us. And if all we look to is Jesus washing our feet, he also washed the feet of the disciple Judas, who betrayed him. There is a day coming in which we will be judged by our works. And Jesus is consistently reminding us that, yes, he gets us, but he also changes us by his great love. And he does that through our faith. Jonathan Edwards, in his religious affections, says a person may be full of talk about his own religious experiences, but often it is more a bad than a good sign. It is like a tree that is full of leaves that seldom bears much fruit, or it is like a cloud which, although it appears to promise, much fullness of rain is only wind to a dry and thirsty earth. Strong, false affections are much more likely to declare themselves than true ones. It is the nature of false religion to be showy and visible as it was with the Pharisees. And we live in a world that says no judgments, but here Jesus is judging. He said, I, I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. And his word is a two-edged sword. It is meant to divide. It divides the sheep from the goats. It divides the doves from the wolves. I, I used to imagine when he was passing by this tree, because not very many of us are familiar with a fig tree, and in my childhood imagination, I always imagined this tree as being filled with fig newtons, and you could pull off the fig newtons off of this, off of this tree. In our, in our backyard growing up, we had mulberry tree and some apple trees and things like that, and you could, you could pick the fruit off of them. But, but here Jesus describes something that was very common in the ancient world, simply a fig tree from which you could eat and use for a variety uh, of different things. This temple cleansing that he's gone through is the judgment of Israel's worship. How do they truly worship? But the tree cursing is, in fact, a judgment of Israel's works. Listen to Hosea 9.8. I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your fathers as the first fruits on the fig tree in its season. And in using this fig tree, the people would have seen a powerful visual. This is what it says in Luke 13, 6 through 9. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his, vineyard, in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, Look, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But he answered and said to him, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it, and if it bears fruit, well. But if not... After that, you can cut it down. So here's Jesus spending 30 years of his earthly ministry, and now the last three coming down to Jerusalem, three years in, three years out. Here he is, hungry, which is ironic since he's been staying at the home of Lazarus and Mary and Martha. Martha, of all people, would have been the candidate to fix him breakfast. She's always busy about the Lord's work. But the storyline is deliberate here. Now, now, what exactly happens? We have to look at the rest of the Gospels to see how this measures up. The Gospel of Mark gives us the probable order of events that Jesus would have cursed that fig tree, most likely on Monday, on his way to Jerusalem from Bethany, where he had been staying, and then when they pass by it again on the way to Jerusalem on Tuesday, the tree is now dead. We remember what the Scripture says about fruit. There's a lot of scriptural imagery of fruit, the tree of the knowledge of, uh, of good and evil. What Adam and Eve had as good in the garden eventually became evil. There's scriptural imagery of fruit, of vineyards, of branches. Jesus will say, I am the vine, you are the branches. It is my Father's will that you bear much fruit. He goes on to say, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does not bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit 
fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. He says something else. If anyone does not abide in me, it's thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. How many of you ever burned a brush pile? Doesn't take very long. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you will and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. So what does it look like to be connected to the vine of Christ? Well, in Genesis 3, Adam and Eve cover themselves, of all things, with fig leaves. But it isn't enough. God says only by the blood of the Lamb, by someone taking their place, can they be forgiven, can they have true righteousness. In other words, transformation on the outside will always begin on the inside. The world tells you, look inside yourself, find yourself. But God's Word says, don't look inside yourself, look to Christ. You're not saved because of good works, but unto good works. You don't do these good works in order to be saved, but because you are saved. It is an evidence of being a believer as a child of God. The Proverbs will say, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. He that winneth souls is wise. We think about the fruit of the Spirit, of love, and joy, and gentleness, and goodness, and and faith and meekness and temperance and self-control, that's not just something that I'm trying to uh, attain, attain. It's not as if I'm picking the fruits I like and throwing out the ones that I don't. No, that's, that's in you. That's, that's part of the fruit of the Spirit, that as you grow closer to Christ, you will be more patient. You will be more loving. You'll be more kind. You'll be more temperate, but you have to claim it by Christ working in you. It is an outworking of the Spirit's working in your life. This is what life in Christ looks like. And so what happens when you claim to be a believer, but there's no evidence of fruit in your life? Well, we see this from the very beginning with Adam and Cain and Abel later. You are a first fruits offering unto God. If you don't give of the best you have, it may be an evidence that you don't have what you profess. How can salt not be salty? How can a vine or branch not bear fruit? And if there's no effort on your part, I remember years ago, we were trying to clean up a membership role at, a, at my last church, and we spent about a year going through it just trying to reach people. And if you've ever looked at a church membership role, a lot of times you've got to bring in the CIA and the FBI in order to get a hold of some of these people because the records are not kept up and people move and all these other things. If you count that with our church and add on the bus ministry, there's 2,500 people on our rolls, 2,400 of whom we can't find if we contacted the FBI. But in seeking to get a hold of people, I remember one specific lady, when we asked her family if she still wanted to be on the roll, she wanted her son, she said, her words, to at least remain on some roll. That way when he died, he might have a chance. Brother and sister, being on a church roll ain't going to get you into the kingdom of God. The only thing that will is faith in Christ. And here we see Jesus exercising humility and and obedience. He tells us to bear fruits in keeping with repentance. But Israel had not borne those fruits. They had forgotten Hosea 9 and 10, which says, Like grapes in the wilderness, I found Israel. Like the first fruit on the fig tree in its first season, I saw your fathers. So Jesus, coming unto his own, but his own received him not. If there is no fruit, there is no root, because the fruit will always reveal the root. And so Jesus does something bizarre. He curses the fig tree, representing Israel, and it withers and dies. And then he says, later on in this very chapter, in verse 43, Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a people producing its fruits. And so all we can weigh and measure in evidence to the kingdom of God is, are you producing fruit? Is the evidence of your life enough to convict you as a believer? Not that that holds sway on whether or not you are a believer, but it is an evidence of whether or not you profess what you possess. 
But that's not the question that the disciples ask him. They don't ask him how we can bear more fruit. They don't say who's bearing it and, and who's not bearing it and how to grow it back and how to make the, the fig tree come alive. They, they, they ask him something rather specific. They marveled saying in verse 20, how did that fig tree wither at once? And, and Jesus tells them that if they will simply live lives of obedience by bearing fruit, in keeping with repentance through the power of Christ, they too can have this faith because your relationship with God is directly impacted by your obedience to his word every time. When you follow him, you see his evidence. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. William Carey said years ago, expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. And you can imagine Jesus looking out towards that Mount of Olives or looking towards that Temple Mount across from the Kidron Valley and saying that with faith, you can throw that mountain into the sea if you will believe. It reminds us that there's a day coming when the mountains will be made low and the valleys shall be exalted, the crooked be made straight, the rough places plain, the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. But until that day comes, you got to do what you and I are created to do. This is what Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. One pastor put it this way, If you seek righteousness first, you get happiness. But if you seek happiness first, you get neither. That's why the scripture says, Seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. So so what does that fruit bearing look like? There's the right fruit, there's the wrong fruit, there's Adam and Eve not giving, excuse me, Cain and Abel not giving of the best they have. There's Psalm 1 talking about being planted, the man of God being planted like a tree by the river of water, his roots shall not be shaken. There's the branches of Israel, there's the root of Jesse, there's branches growing out of his roots. The Romans would use figs for great symbolism. Jesus is, is, is taking that analogy and put it before people who would have been very familiar with the Roman Empire. But he's really asking, does your life bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And if it does, you can have faith that will be able to remove mountains. Years ago, there was a submarine, a United States submarine in the waters of the Pacific. A sailor was stricken with appendicitis, and the nearest surgeon was thousands of miles away. There was a pharmacist on board that had watched the doctors do it, watched this seaman's temperature rise to 106 degrees. His only hope would have been an operation. That pharmacist said, I've watched doctors do it. I think I could. What do you say? And the sailor, without having much else of a choice to live, consented. And so in that room, about the size of a, of a Pullman drawing room, just a, just a small room, the patient was stretched out on a table beneath a floodlight. They said the mate and the assistant officers dressed in reversed pajamas tops, masked their face with gauze. The crew stood by the diving planes to keep the ship steady. The cook boiled water for sterilizing. A tea strainer served as an antiseptic cone. A broken-handled scalpel was the operating instrument. Alcohol drained from the torpedoes was the antiseptic. Bent tablespoons served to keep the muscles open. And after cutting through layers of the muscle, the mate took 20 minutes to find the appendix. Two and a half hours later, the last stitch was sewed just as the drop of ether gave out. And 13 days later, that patient was back at work. Now, this was a much more magnificent feat than if trained surgers, surgeons who were fully equipped and an operating room of a modern hospital had performed it. But if you, if you look here, study what Jesus is saying here. Greater works than these you shall do because I go unto my Father. Because for Jesus to be perfectly God, to work directly on a lost soul, to bring them out of death into Life is no great thing because he can do it. But for him to use us to do it is a tremendous, wonderful thing. And he invites us as broken vessels and broken instruments and broken people to have faith so that others may have it too. Does your fruit have a root? Would you bow your heads with me this morning? Invitation will come in just a few minutes. The service will be over with. 
But I want us to consider, are our lives indicative of fruit in keeping with repentance? This is the great question that, that, that Jesus asked, just a, a normal fig tree seemingly. But Jesus said, because it did not bear fruit, it withered at once. You know, God really isn't interested in whether or not you're a good person, although that's good. He's not interested in your good works, although that's good. He's interested in, do you know his son? And have you repented and trusted in the name of Jesus? And if you've done so, then you are connected to the vine of Christ. But friends, if you claim to be connected to the vine of Christ, and there's no root, there's no evidence in your life, you need to ask yourself if you have the very faith that you profess. This morning, God invites us to see impossible things done through the power of His Spirit. Father, I thank You for what You've done in our lives. I thank You for the tremendous measure of faith that You have shown in using Your followers to do what we cannot do on our own. Father, this morning, I pray that You would raise up in this room men and women, boys and girls, who would go and tell of your excellent greatness, who would see that in living lives connected to the vine of Christ, we can't help but produce fruit. Lord, help us to understand it is our Father's will that we produce much fruit. Some 30, some 60, some 100. God isn't concerned about the number. Lord, you're concerned about our heart. Help us, Lord, we pray. My prayer is if someone doesn't know Jesus, may today be the day of salvation. And it's in his name we pray and for his sake. Amen.